is of power because we are kings and our words matter. Somebody preached the gospel, the Holy Spirit began to work and convict you, convince you, show you, show you that you're headed in the wrong direction. And all of a sudden, you begin to stretch out your hand and say, Lord, save me. I'm in the wrong direction. I'm going the wrong way. I'll end up in the wrong destination. I'll be lost forever. So save me. And God saved you through Jesus Christ. And now you're in the right direction. That's repentance. Amen. Praise God. Sam Chelladurai invites you to a special pastor seminar at AFT Chennai on the 20th, 21st, and 22nd of January 2016 from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Please note that all messages will be in Tamil only. Prior registration with a fee of Rs. 700 is required. You can register online at www.refsam.org or you can call us at the numbers on the screen. We look forward to seeing you there. In Acts chapter 8, we read about Philip preaching in the town of Samaria. He goes and preaches in Samaria, and this is what we are told. Listen to this. Just I want you to get a taste of this. I want you to understand how we enter into the covenant, how the covenant is prepared and made ready, we know, through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, how people are brought into it is what we are talking about. In chapter 8, verse 5, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. See, he preached Christ unto them. Philip preached Christ unto them. He didn't preach a religion. He preached what? Christ. In other words, he presented Christ to them. He introduced Christ to them. He brought them to Christ. He told them who he is and what he has done and what he means and, and so on. There was an introduction of Christ in his preaching. Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. Verse 18 and 19. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not wrought by me, to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. 
through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. He says he has preached the gospel of Christ fully. And what happened as he preached it? People have been, by signs and wonders, by the Spirit of God, they have been made obedient by word and deed. You know, that is what the gospel did. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. If you, read about, if you want to read about what Christian preaching is all about, chapter 1 and 2 of 1 Corinthians is the best portion in the New Testament to read. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21, 23, and 24. For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. See, preaching sounds foolish to some people. I'll show you who it sounds foolish to. For many people, preaching of the gospel sounds like foolishness. But through the foolishness of preaching, God has chosen to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign and the Sikhs, uh, G Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto Jews a stumbling block, unto the Gentiles, uh, unto the Greeks the fo uh, foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. To them which are called is the most important thing to notice there. If God is calling you to salvation, if God has got a hand upon you, he wants to draw you into salvation and you are hearing the gospel, to you the gospel becomes appealing while the man sitting next to you finds it foolishness. Utter nonsense he finds it to be. He does not understand a thing. He thinks it's all a waste of time. But you sitting there because you are being called by God and the Holy Spirit has started working on you, to you it is not foolishness, you, to you it makes sense. So you get up and go and you give your life to Jesus and you begin to believe and so on. And uh, for others it's foolishness, for a normal man it sounds foolishness. It says for Jews, it talks about the Jews, it says they require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. That's the way they were. The Greeks were known for their interest in philosophy. And the city of Athens were, was filled with people who came and debated and gave speeches, you know, uh, with some provoking thoughts, uh, talking about various systems of philosophy and so on. That's the place where Aristotle, Plato, and all these guys, uh, you know, did their work. So they were very much interested in philosophy. They were very intellectual type of people. So they, when they wanted to hear a person preach something, they expected something philosophical, something titillating to something that just was nice to their itching ears. They wanted to hear some new idea, some new philosophy, something fascinating. And they went to hear Paul, and this man was preaching Christ crucified. They said, what nonsense is this? We thought you were going to come and preach something great, some philosophy, some new idea. But you're preaching about a guy who got crucified in Jerusalem. Maybe he did something wrong. That's why they crucified him. And besides, he could not save himself. He hung on the cross in shame. And they beat him and they spit on him and he couldn't do nothing. He couldn't save himself. And you are proclaiming now that he's the savior. What kind of nonsense is this? We don't want to hear this. Proclaim some big king as a savior or some great warrior as a savior. Some commander like Alexander the Great as savior. Not this person who hangs on a tree. Like a cursed one. Don't proclaim him as a savior. We don't understand. How can he be a savior when he can't save himself? See, they didn't see that he was a sacrifice for man's sins. They could not see that nobody can take his life, but he gave his life and that's how he died. They can't see all of that. They consider this a foolishness. So the Greeks seek after wisdom and the Jews seek after science. They were re very religious people. They were into miracles, you see. For them, if you went to their meeting, something must shake, something must fall, something must roll, you know. Otherwise, otherwise they said, you know, nothing is happening. And here Paul is simply preaching. Preaching what? Preaching Christ crucified. Christ on the cross of Calvary and what happened there. Why he died, why his blood was shed. What is the meaning of, this, of the wounds that he received in his body? And like I spoke last week, why did he thirst? Why did he say that he thirsted on the cross of Calvary? What is the meaning of the crown of thorns that was placed? Paul was preaching about this and they considered it utter nonsense. They said, give us some sign. Give us some wonders. 
do something they thought the cross and the whole preaching was a waste of time but it is through that that god saves something happens in the preaching of the gospel that is why i am excited that i am a preacher because something happens beyond me i cannot do it but god does it i am just supposed to preach but god through the preaching takes the preaching and reaches people's hearts and turns people's heart people's heart toward god why are so many people seated here today to hear because you've heard the gospel some of some of you heard it on tv some of you heard it somewhere you know and you wanted to hear more you wanted more of it because your hearts have been drawn by god i didn't draw you i didn't say please come here you know be seated in my meeting and you know we need some people to fill the chairs or something like that now i'd like fill, i like to fill the chairs but nobody will come you know <laughs> i've tried it <laughs> believe me which preacher you don't that doesn't like people to come and crowd his meetings you know i like people to come also but i found out that nobody will come if you say come 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 so i quit saying come i started trying to preach like jesus would preach so that they will come so that they will come and hear what we have to say so it is i'm just preaching i'm just a preacher but the holy spirit works through the preaching and reaching the hearts of people and drawing them to himself now this is what happens so the revelation of god is there the revelation of ourselves is there the preaching brings about that revelation the words of the gospel brings about that revelation all of a sudden there is a drawing towards god and you begin to respond to the gospel all right now let's go a little further there are two things that happen if you look at it in detail there are two things that happen in the process when you hear the gospel one is repentance the other is faith faith and repentance let me first cover faith or let me first talk about repentance and then we'll talk about faith what is repentance repentance literally means a radical change of mind a radical change means a total unusual transformation change of mind that is what repentance is now repentance is not so much about repenting from sin because sin is not the issue there when you repent it is not repenting from sin even though sin is bad and you know we do you know want to turn our back on sin and so on it is not so much repenting from sin because sin or sin problem has been taken care of in and through jesus christ what do we repent of then or what do we repent from then we repent from our own ways we thought that our life was all right that we lived our own life without god that is the sin that is the main sin that we were without god we didn't believe in god god had no place in us we had no place for god in our lives we didn't care about god we lived basically without god and a relationship with god that is sin other things that we do such as lying and stealing and whatever we do killing and 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 so on that is sin but that is sinful deed because we are sinners well, who are sinners people always accuse us of calling them sinners you know so i always like to explain to them we don't mean that kind of sinner you know like some bad person or something like that. sometimes they are good people in the natural way if you look at it people are good people in some way but the thing is why the bible calls all have sinned and come short of the glory of god the bible says everybody is a sinner it says in what ways everybody is a sinner some people object to it they say well, well i'm far better than anybody in my street you know how can you call me a sinner i'm not a you know bad person at all how can you say that i'm a sinner well please understand what we mean or what the bible means when it calls people sinners it it says all have sinned and come short of the glory of god means that everyone has rejected god has no place for god they don't have a relationship with god that is why all are sinners so when we say a sin when we say a person is sinner we mean first of all a sinful condition not what he does but what he is 
Hello. What is he? He is a sinner because he has no God in his life. God has no place in his life. He has no faith in God. He has no relationship with God. That is why he is a sinner. Does he do sinful deeds? Yeah, he does sinful deeds, but he does them because he is a sinner. A sinner does sinful deeds just because, just like a mango tree gives mango fruits. Right? Now, so you got to understand uh, how this whole thing works. So repentance means not so much turning from your sins, because sins are sinful deeds, it is turning from your own ways and your way of living because you thought your way was right and that is what landed you in a sinfulness and sinful lifestyle. So you're turning from, not from sins really, turning from sin itself, the sin of not knowing God and having no place for God. When you turn from sin, then sins have no place in your life. So the word of God, the gospel came to you Somebody preached the gospel, the Holy Spirit began to work and convict you, convince you, show you, show you that you're headed in the wrong direction. And all of a sudden, you begin to stretch out your hand and say, Lord, save me. I'm in the wrong direction. I'm going the wrong way. I'll end up in the wrong destination. I'll be lost forever. So save me. And God saved you through Jesus Christ. And now you're in the right direction. That's repentance. What about faith? See, faith works like this. Faith is not a feeling. Feeling may be there in faith. See, don't misunderstand me. I'm not against feelings. I'm a good old Pentecostal boy, so I'm all for feelings, you know. <laughs> I can feel it in my hands and I can feel it in my feet. I'm a feeling guy, you know. I can feel it. <laughs> <laughs> I can feel it in every bone, every part of my body, you know. I'm all for feeling. I'm not against it. Please understand me. But... <laughs> Faith is not about feelings. Faith is much more than feelings. It is not just about our mind, our emotion, how you feel, and so on. You may be in a meeting, you may feel good, you may feel emotionally all elevated and, you know, lifted and uh, built up and so on. But then after the meeting is over, it all goes out, you know. That is what is called feelings. You feel good, like one lady wrote to me and said, Pastor, please have those meetings every day because my boy likes to come to your meetings. The rest of the days, he's a mess. <laughs> so why don't you have these meetings every day? See? I wrote her back and said, why don't you have it every day in your house? <laughs> I can't be having meetings every day. But I can understand the lady's feelings. She finds this boy liking our meetings. He comes and shows up in our meetings because he feels good. When he comes in here, he feels a certain peace and he feels, you know, that uh, he is hearing something that is useful for him and he's able to kind of enjoy himself maybe. Maybe the music and the preaching, everything gets to him and is meaningful to him and he, enjo he enjoys himself. When he goes back, he meets his old friends and the life is... Uh, back on track again in the old way and uh, again he's making a mess of himself so the mother says he's a mess from monday to saturday sundays he comes to your meeting so have it every day he'll be all right <laughs> because his life revolves around some feelings he he he's responding to some feelings which is all right to me really at least he's getting something <laughs> hopefully he'll get the whole Lord, a little later. But the thing is, faith is more than just feelings. Faith involves the whole person. What is the whole person? The whole person is spirit, soul, and body, right? Spirit is the inner man. Sometimes the Bible calls it the heart. Heart doesn't mean the part of the body that pumps blood, you know. Heart means biblically the inner man, the spirit of man. Soul is the mind and then the body. So spirit, soul, and body. Faith involves the whole person. It begins in your spirit, in your heart. Faith, this is the place of residence of faith, the heart. With the heart, man believeth unto righteousness, Romans 10, 10, right? With the heart, not with the mind, with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. What is the difference between believing with the heart and believing with the mind? Now, we believe a lot of things with our mind, but we never go through with it. We never follow it. We believe a whole lot of stuff. Good things. 
I believe this, I believe that. A lot of Christians are like that. Yeah, I believe this and yeah, I believe that. But they don't do anything that they believe. They just believe it mentally. It is called mental assent. Giving assent to certain truths mentally. Agreeing with certain truths mentally. But never in the heart accepting it. If you accept something in the heart and believe something in the heart, you will do what you believe. That's the difference between mental assent and heart believing. Heart believing is different. So believing is with the heart. But it affects the mind also where it results in repentance. So this is what, this is the pro process that takes place in salvation. You begin to have faith in the heart, believe now that Jesus is the son of God. And then you mentally, there is something that happens, there is a turnaround. You determine and decide that you've been wrong and God is right. Now you're going to live God's way. So you turn around mentally. And then in body also, there is an outward bodily manifestation of that faith. Because faith involves the whole person, I said. It do really does. For example, sin involves the whole person. I'll show you how. When Adam and Eve sinned, how did they sin? First of all, sin happened in their hearts. Before they, ate, they, before they ate the fruit, the forbidden fruit, they sinned in their heart. How did they sin? They sinned by saying in their heart, I'm going to do whatever I wish I want to do. Who's God to tell me not to eat this fruit? I will eat whichever one I like. I will do whatever I like. I don't need God to tell me. I will be my own God. That is sin. That is the sin of the heart of Adam and Eve. It came from the heart. Whenever they thought those thoughts in the heart, that was sin. Then a decision was made in the mind that we, they, they were going to eat that. And then physically they took the fruit and ate it. Until they ate the fruit physically, sin was not completed. Hello? Are you there? Sin was not completed until they ate the pr fruit physically. It came in the heart until it received its full manifestation or until they took the fr fruit and put it in their mouth and ate it, it was not completed. When they did that, when spirit, soul, and body, everything got involved, it was a total expression of sin. In the same way, just as sin involves spirit, soul, and body, in the same way, faith involves spirit, soul, and body. When you believe, you believe in the heart, and it affects the mind, and then something must happen outwardly. And that is what is called in the Bible as water baptism. Hello. Are you there? Now people wonder about water baptism. And I've not talked much about it recently. But let me just say it because you, know, you need to understand it biblically, not religiously. You know, we, in those days we went about like this. Are you baptized? When are you going to get baptized? And people were scared, you know, my God, you know. Don't go around that church because they'll dunk you in the water, you know. <laughs> we were waiting for people to catch them and bring them under water somehow. And we were proud. We baptized a thousand people this year, you know, as if there was a medal given to us <laughs> in heaven for baptizing so many, you know. We were very eager to <laughs> baptize people, but never cared to explain what this is, you know. I don't take that approach nowadays. I'm, you know... The only way you're going to be baptized here is when you come and ask to be baptized, you'll be baptized here, you know. But I'm going to preach about it, what the Bible says. I'm a Bible preacher. I just simply tell you what the Bible says. It's up to you. I'll give you the real meaning of what, what baptism is all about. Like I said, faith involves the whole person. It involves the spirit, the mind, and the body. Heart, it starts. and the mind, it results in repentance, where there's a turnaround in the mind. And then it is never complete. Faith is never complete without this physical manifestation of going under water and receiving water baptism. That is the biblical teaching, really. You know, that is why when Jesus told the disciples, he said, go, go into all the world. Matthew's gospel, chapter 28, verse 18, 19, and 20 is what I'm quoting. Go into all the world, preach the gospel, make disciples, then baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Right? teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. Go preach the gospel, make disciples, and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then teach them, put them in a church, and teach them continuously. Now, when people come and take baptism here, one of the questions they ask is, 
Will you come to church regularly, hear the word of God and walk by it? Because some people think of baptism as a ticket to heaven. So they've come to get the tickets, like World Cup tickets, you know. So they say, well, brother, no, no, I just came for baptism. I said, then you find another church. Because we baptize people, not just to be baptizing them and sending to heaven. We baptize people so that we can continue to teach them because our responsibility does not end with baptism. Our responsibility is to continue to teach them after they are baptized, put them in the body of Christ and continue to build them up by the word of God. So this is one of the questions that we ask. So every time the command is given, it is given like that. Even in Matthew chapter 16, we read about how Jesus said, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Baptism is talked about. Baptism is put right there with it. It doesn't say just preach the gospel, make disciples. It says then baptize them. It is joined together. Let's clap our hands. The Bible says enter his gates with thanksgiving. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Come into his courts with praise. Enter his presence rejoicing. Singing great and mighty is his name. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the timbrel and harp. And every creature in heaven. Joy forever. For the Lord is good and this mercy and joy 